Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. Hello, Merrin Talks Money listeners. It's Merrin Somerset Webb. We are bringing you something very special over the next week. Recordings of the conversations I had at Pammy House for the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Now, for those of you who don't know, and I'm sure there aren't very many of you who don't know this, the Fringe is a three-week arts and culture festival that began in 1947 and takes place in Edinburgh in Scotland every August. For the past few years, I've been hosting conversations about markets, economics, and investing from one of the most special locations as part of this festival. I do it from Pamio House, which is the last home of Adam Smith, philosopher and father of modern economics. It's where he completed the last editions of his bestsellers, The Theory of Moral Sentiments and The Wealth of Nations, top reads of both of them. This year, we did a four-day run in mid-August, and we are bringing you the slightly edited conversations from three of those days. For this panel, I spoke with Dominic Frisbee, British author, comedian, and financial writer. Adam Dixon, who holds the Adam Smith Chair in Sustainable Capitalism at Pamir House, and Duncan McGuinness, who is a fund manager at Ruffer. Enjoy listening. Right, I'm sorry we're a few minutes late, everybody, but they um, they started arguing in the green room. <laughs> <laughs> So I had to get them out. We're here now. Right. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for choosing us from the many wonderful things you have to choose at the Fringe. We appreciate it enormously. Before I start, can I just ask how many of you have been to uh, this conversation before? Okay. So a lot of you know already how it works. Basically, we have these three wonderful guests who I will introduce properly in a minute. And in a minute, I'm going to ask each of them to come up with their favorite Adam Smith quote, and then we're going to talk about those quotes. We're going to talk about those quotes, uh, their relevance when uh, Smith wrote them and their relevance today, and it's going to be fascinating, and they're not going to fight. And then we will have uh, a Q&A at the end. And as we go along, I want you to start thinking about your questions and the things you want to talk about when we get to Q&A, because there will be a prize for the best question. Now, the prize was going to be a copy of my book, my latest book, but I forgot to bring it with me, so you get... um, Something better, better, uh, which is a copy of um, Adam Dixon's book, which he's just told me retails for 90 quid, right? Oh, wow. Yeah. So you can flog it and buy yourself tickets to a couple more. Yeah. Because yeah. 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 that's how Who's your publisher? <laughs> <laughs> or you can download it for free because it's open access. So. Oh, OK. Or download it for free. Or download it for free. Right. And now I think you got you got a little little um, blurb about the house downstairs, didn't you? About how wonderful it is now. Adam Smith lived here, etc., and how he wrote second editions of Wealth of Nations and Moral Sentiments here. So this is a point when I asked you all who has read the Wealth of Nations. And uh, as yeah, there's always always a liar in the audience sometimes too. Um, who has read Moral Sentiments? <laughs> no one dares. <laughs> Okay, well, you know, they're, they're difficult reads. They really are. They're, they're long, they're, uh, you know, in language, blah. But when he wrote these books, they were absolute bestsellers. Up and down the Royal Mile, you could, you know, you could buy pictures of Adam, souvenirs related to Adam Smith. Uh, Wealth of Nations sold out, first edition in six months, and was reprinted over and over and over and over. You know, today we think of him as an academic and moral philosopher, but he was, in fact, a massive celebrity at the time. And this house, obviously, is suitable for a celebrity. But he also had, and I have tried to think of, of more interesting things to talk to, about Adam Smith about, but I can't get away from his pension arrangements. And looking at all of you, I think you're probably mainly interested in pensions as well. And, <laughs> and, yeah, I am. I am interested in pensions too. I think of nothing but how I can get my hands on a defined benefit pension, as a regular listeners to the podcast will know. Now, Adam Smith had, after under three years' work, I'm right, right, under three years, under three years' work, he did as a as a tutor going on a grand tour, tour with the young Duke of Bleclou, grand tour doing what we now call a gap year. Um, <laughs> in those two and a half years, which he had to come back for, uh, from earlier than he expected, he ended up with the equivalent of an inflation-adjusted £60,000 every year for life. Right? £60,000 is a base income. And that was one of the reasons he was able to afford to live here with his mother. Only, only topped by Theresa May. Sure. Or let's I think there's trust actually. Let's I don't. Talk, there's so many. I, even <laughs> so forget, I, so I forget many. which is which. So many, and uh, and uh, today, of course, bus drivers because their defined benefit pension goes up with their salary. Right? We won't dwell on that. Um, 
Now, he also lived here with his mother. And I, we were talking earlier about how, how woke or not woke Pamela House is and whether it should be woke or not. And I thought that I would just introduce the fact that Adam Smith was facilitated by the women around him. I was looking up to see when his mother died because there seemed to be some fuss about it on the internet because she did live here with him all the way through. He only got six years when, in which he had to manage his own household, poor dear. Um, and I found a book called Who Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner? <laughs> right? Adam Smith has a permanent entry in world history. Margaret Douglas does not. Adam Smith developed the idea of the success of self-interest of the free market. Margaret Douglas cooked his dinner. And the book is all about how he couldn't possibly have done it without her. But of course, I doubt that on 60 grand a year as a base and all his celebrity income, his mother cooked his dinner either. <laughs> so I think we'll write a new book on that. Right, onwards. So She was 91 she when was? she died. Must yeah. be one of the oldest people in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think? Yeah. I mean, we might come on to this later, but, you know, all this stuff about how we're living longer. In fact, if you didn't die in childbirth and you didn't die of some nasty accident down a coal mine, etc., the lifespan of people who didn't die of those things was similar then to now. If people I, who didn't die of nasty then, stuff lived to their 80s and 90s. Old. You Sorry. think? Yeah, maybe. Anyway, interestingly, you know, at, at that time, it was relatively normal, wasn't it, to live as families, to live with your mother, etc. And now it increasingly is again. I don't know if you all saw the numbers out a few days ago about the percentage of young people who still live with their parents. And in Italy, it is now over 50% of people between 25 and 35 still live with their parents. Yeah. Anyone got an adult child living with them? <laughs> Anyone like them to leave? <laughs> we'll go on to house prices later. Anyway. Dominic Frisbee, our first guest, who writes the very popular Substack newsletter, The Flying Frisbee. Uh, do we all know about Substack? Yeah. Yep. Okay, brilliant. So sign up for that. He also makes comic videos, which are excellent, and sings excellent comic songs. Mm -hmm. And we might, you haven't got your, haven't got your banjo with you. Ukulele, sorry. Ah, no ukulele. This is a shame, because my son's absolute favourite song is one of uh, Dominic's top hits, right? Um, I, I think, think I can't say the lyric I at, think at this I'm time in love of day. With Nigel Farage, oh, that one, yes. not that one, not that other one. Okay. But we can we can all harmonize under <laughs> you, so we can, we can. If you wait okay. wait a bit, the show's going to get better. And what rhymes with Farage is called as massage. So the the lyrics are great. Anyway, that's Dominic. He's also the author of three books and a well-known financial writer. He's, uh, for those of you who read Money Week, with which I am no longer involved, um, do you still write for Money Week? Occasionally. Yeah, a regular writer for Money Week and, and some excellent advice on things so that we'll get on to you later. Um, Duncan McGuinness, who is a fund manager uh, at Ruffa and uh, no Substack. No, no podcast, no, no uh, books. Only your podcast. You might be, the, right? the odd article on yep. Ruffer's website or mm -hmm. a Ruffer review, mm -hmm. our annual actually, periodical, which is know, which is pretty good actually. It's really, really good. I'll <laughs> tell you what. Um, you're on again later in the week. If you bring it, then we'll make that the um, the free gift for the best question. Wow, thank you. I don't think I'll be able to sell it for ninety quid, but <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, and uh, Adam Dixon, who holds the Adam Smith Chair in Sustainable Capitalism here at Pamir House. Right. First quote, who did I say was going first? Adam is going to give us this quote first. Okay. So, um, my quote, Adam's quote, not this Adam. In such improvements, each nation ought not only to endeavor itself to excel, but from the love of mankind to promote instead of obstructing the excellence of its neighbors. These are all proper objects of national emulation not of national prejudice or envy. Now, and this is from the theory of moral sentiments, not from the wealth of nations. So this shows to show that Smith was thinking globally about geopolitics, even when he was writing the theory of moral sentiments. And this quote mostly pertains to differences between France and Britain at the time and the competition between the two. Even later on in, in, in down the page, he mentions and says, most people here in Britain wouldn't really care about what's happening in China and Japan because it's way over there. Now you fast forward to 21st century, what kind of world that we live in? One of, I would say in my recent book, state capitalism. And that state capitalism is not limited to China. But Chinese state capitalism, I would argue, is actually begetting more state capitalism elsewhere, here in the West, in Britain, in Europe, 
in the United States. We're all becoming state capitalists. Now, this doesn't mean necessarily state ownership or state investment funds. It's all the panoply of the tools of the state from subsidies to sanctions to investment screening regulations. The world is becoming increasingly fractured. Just this last week, I was in Helsinki at the Helsinki Geoeconomics Week um, as part of the new Geoeconomic Society. And this was a grouping of lawyers and consultants and people from the defense industry and a handful of academics that nobody cares what they have to say. And, you know, things were being said about, wow, this is going to be a compliance tsunami coming. And I had a conversation with a lawyer, an American lawyer, was saying, this is great for us. We have all kinds of business because governments are saying we need to check these investments. And it all constrains, I think, possibly innovation. It constrains and makes us, you know, not be open to trade, open to sharing ideas. Now, certainly what's driving this, it's because China is becoming increasingly competitive. Some of that competition and the, the market share that it's getting is certainly one of taking ideas and, and, and running with them. But at the same time, what, what worries me is increasingly we're looking at China and we're looking at it as a national security threat. And all these economic policies are about national security. But often it seems that it's about protecting national industries, protecting the incumbent firms. And I wonder, is this good for capitalism? Is it good for societies? Because, yes, yeah, sometimes China has an unfair advantage that's driven by state subsidies or, or, or some, some policy that the Chinese are doing to protect their own industries. But often you think, well, actually, no, China's doing well because they go to scale quickly. They identify a problem uh, in the world and look for a solution. I mean, we think of, of electric cars as, you know, this is going to be the future, maybe not as soon as we think, but it's probably going at least for urban transport. And Tesla is doing very well, but Tesla's still mostly a luxury car. And who's driving the, the, the new Ford, the new Model T? It's Chinese automakers. And the bigger question is, are they doing that because the Chinese government has supported them? Yes, possibly. But it's partly because the German automakers were kind of asleep at the wheel. And even now, they don't want to it embrace like you're them. arguing for state capitalism, not against it. Well, no, but again. Things seem to be going better for China than for us. I mean, you talk about national security. Yes. Right? Well, take for, back to electric cars mm -hmm. and back to energy. So, for yes. example, one of the reasons why possibly we're seeing a lot more state capitalism mm -hmm. is the energy transition. Yes. Because we are in a very mm -hmm. unusual situation mm -hmm. where we're trying to do something that doesn't make economic yes. sense. That might make climate sense, but certainly doesn't yeah. make economic sense. So we're trying to do that. So you need massive state intervention for mm -hmm. it. Is that fair? So that might be one of the reasons we're seeing. Yeah. more state intervention and you look to China mm -hmm. who are now the global leaders in uh, solar and nuclear mm -hmm. which is probably what we're going to be using what we yeah, should, be using. should be using and the rest of us are falling behind massively yeah. on that because we're terrified mm -hmm. of nuclear and we haven't got much solar mm -hmm. and America doesn't really care about nuclear or solar because they've got so much shale mm -hmm. so that's where the problem might be and so we should be looking at national security in terms of energy mm -hmm. And that feels to me like that's where a lot of it is coming from. Yes, but there's even more. I think there's, there's, there, it's more than just, I mean, it, it's, it, the a level of, of scrutiny and concern around national security and dual use for military and civil use for technologies, there's a lot of concern that, that it's, it's, that bleeds into other parts of the, of the economy. I agree. I mean, the scale of the energy transition means we need to put a lot of money in. There needs to be a lot of, of forward thinking and planning, and maybe the private sector isn't there uh, to do it. But my concern is that this state capitalism bleeds into the rest of the economy when, and, and it partly is due, I think, and going back to Smith's quote, is this um, national prejudice or envy. There's a bit of envy that China is doing so well when actually I think we need to put the mirror up to us. And again, it's not us saying that we need the state to come in and push us. But that we actually need to think about, you know, what are we doing? Are we protecting the incumbents instead of actually And how driving? much are we dulling productivity and exactly. innovation by overlaying regulation after regulation exactly. after regulation? And Adam Smith That's, would have been horrified, yeah. right? Yeah. We've got loads of, of yeah. quotes that show how, how strongly he felt 
right. about governments directing his one. Well, but he, he wouldn't be necessarily against large scale public works. I mean, he, he's no, very, very clear pro the, those, yeah. pro those, right? And so I think that's where we have to separate out the kind of good state capitalism, if you like, from 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 the bad. And and my concern is is that we're not the the global economy that we came to be used to the openness and trade is increasingly being closed and we are seeing more and more protectionism and that i think is bad for capitalism but there is no way back from that i'm going to bring duncan here because you've talked about this a lot there is from what? here you have <laughs> we have talked about this a lot the rise of protectionism across yes. the world and the you know the reversal of the of the, the great stability and peace that we've had over there in the post war period what what sort of adam says feels pretty hard to argue against you know, the, the idea of this rise of state capitalism you look at the increasing tax take the increasing proportion of people that work for the public sector it seems sort of inexorable and you're right there's there's probably a good form of state capitalism, which would be more public investment in infrastructure. And there's probably a less good form of state capitalism, which is gold-plated public sector pensions mm -hmm. and, and, and you know pay, ri pay rises for everyone as soon as, as, soon as we, we get in the door. Those, the return on those investments are probably lower mm -hmm. than on something, maybe HS2 is too uh, political a topic, but you know, it's, things like that. Um, so I think the, the, the West does appear to be sort of drifting into a sort of managed decline, doesn't it? There's a lack of ambition from, from our leaders. Uh, you look at you know, Trump looking like he's going to be pretty isolationist if he gets in on the, in, in the US. And I, but if I was to contrast state capitalism, if we want to call that, versus some sort of alternative, more freewheeling sort of uh, capitalism, I saw an unbelievable stat this week that I had to go and, go and fact check because I didn't believe it. If you look at... MSCI China uh, over the last 30 years, the return is zero. Zero in the Chinese stock market over 30 years. Now, of course, the Chinese economy has achieved an extraordinary amount in 30 years. Sort of growth in GDP, growth in living standards, lifting literally hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. But it's not been anything like the sort of capitalism that we would identify with. But isn't this with. Um, historically standard in that one of the yes. mistakes that investors make yes. over and over and over again is assuming is. that economic growth yes. translates into stock market returns and it almost never does yep. because of the vast amount of capital you need to create the growth means that there isn't the excess available for stock market it, it growth. Is, it is. Right? So, this, so this is... Would it should have been expected, but instead everyone got terribly excited. Look at China, it's growing, we must buy the market. Flat over 30 years, but, you, but it is one of the most sort of fundamental points that, that, that everyone should think about before they start investing, is that there is almost no correlation between GDP growth and investment returns. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you've, you've had several people in your podcast talking about things like the capital cycle, mm -hmm. which might sort of imply actually the opposite. Um, so yeah, definitely worth noting, you hear people talk about chasing where the growth is, it doesn't matter. I mean, look at the last five, ten years, like I just said, China has had a zero return over the last 30 years. Japan, notoriously low growth and yet a very strong stock market return. FTSE 100? FTSE 100 next. <laughs> <laughs> but Japan as well, I mean, the big mistake everyone makes with Japan is just looking at the GDP numbers, not yes. the GDP per head numbers. Yeah. And GDP per head, as I say on the podcast every single week, all we should care about is GDP per head because we care about people's individual living standards. We don't care about GDP as a whole, right? I want to come back to state capitalism briefly, and I want to come back to the, um, the uh, new National Wealth Fund, which of course is absolutely nothing of the sort. It's a, it's a new National Debt Fund. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Let's say that it really was a wealth fund. Yes. Let's say it really did have actually seven billion in it, as opposed to seven billion that we're going to borrow and yes. put in it. Um, what would be a good thing to do with it? What would be a good type of state-sponsored yes. infrastructure so investment? So I think it's it's important that you note that the National Wealth Fund is nothing like uh, the sovereign wealth funds that we we think about. And and I've got a book on that, a couple of books on that as well. So not like my books, sorry, Marin. <laughs> The latest one is, is open access too, but it's important because I think um, what we think of, of sovereign wealth funds is either the big Norwegian funds that have a lot of money, but there are a number of the smaller, more nimble, what we call strategic 
investment funds. So that's the, you know, Tamasek in Singapore or Mubadala in, in, in Abu Dhabi that make really targeted investments. They're involved in, in national development plans. Um, they're global in scope increasingly um, as more and more sophisticated investors. But that's not what we have here in Britain with this new National Wealth Fund. Um, so it's on the one hand, but the, the point to say about these strategic investment funds is you don't need that much money. You can actually leverage through the market. You can use existing state assets to do that. But that doesn't seem to be what they're doing in this case, because the strategic investment funds that we think of in the so sovereign wealth fund world are those that are they're set up with an independent governance structure. They look very similar, if not almost equal to or what you think of as a venture capital firm or a private equity fund. The managers come from the private sector. The, the interactions with the, the political class is, is maybe at a high level in terms of oversight and saying, well, we're interested in you going to do this, but then they're usually left to do their own devices. What we see here with the new national wealth funds is it seems to be, well, we're just going to use some existing state institutions, which I think is a good thing, right? Let's There's let's not create ones, yeah. new things when we have existing things like the, the British Investment Bank or the Infrastructure Investment Bank. So that's a good thing. Um, but my view on it is that, you know, why in a country that has one of the deepest and largest capital markets with international banks, countless private equity funds, venture capitalists, high net worth individuals. Why isn't the market developing these assets in yeah. Britain? If they're good enough, if they're good why enough, aren't they what they're happening? doing? And, and if the state is going to invest, and this is nothing to say that there's there's you know there's nothing wrong with with state investing in roads and things. I mean, this goes back to Adam Smith, but it's it's that shouldn't Parliament use its existing tools? Shouldn't they do you know good old fashioned public works where they're not trying to to you know, beat Goldman Sachs. They're saying, no, no, we're, we're just, outside the just market. For, I think what he's trying to say is just fill in the potholes. Just fill, fill in the fill potholes, in the potholes. exactly, yeah. right? And so I think that's that's the, the, the concern I have is that why is labor trying to, you know, they're, they're kind of trying to be sort of city-like when actually just go back to being, just, just do government, let's have a separation. And then more importantly, try to figure out why this big, deep, financial market is not investing in this country and change the policies to make that so. Fair enough. What would you put in it, either of you, to, if you were, if you got the seven billion, which, by the way, is probably going to come from your pension. So that's where the money is going to would, I would agree, I think, uh, a low conviction opinion with the idea of, of separation. I think there is a difference. You should make some investments in pursuit of investment returns to fund you know, future, future expenditure like you do with your pension. And then there should be public works, which are governmental investments where the objective is not returns per se, but to sort of push out the, what was it called, the production possibility frontier, you know, to grow the potential for future growth within the economy. And, and it's absolutely fine for governments to make low returning investments if they add broader societal benefits. But I, I just think you, you, you head down a, a difficult path when, when you conflate the two and when you end, you end up with projects that fall between two stools. Well, I did get, when I wrote about this recently, and I concurrently wrote a column about uh, the UK's Bitcoin, the amount of Bitcoin that we have seized from criminals. And uh, it's quite a lot now. I mean, well into the proper billions, right? Uh, what we should do with it, in my view, is that we should sell it immediately before everything goes horribly wrong and then uh, take the money and do something useful with it. But I got a lot do, of responses saying, uh, <laughs> wait, wait, I'm getting to Dominic, I'm getting to Dominic. I got a lot of responses going, don't be ridiculous this is the most valuable asset in the world and it's going to go to the moon and you need the uk needs to take all that bitcoin and put it inside our national wealth fund and then one day we too will have a norwegian style national wealth fund and uh, dominic what is your view on that i definitely think it, i mean it might be that legislatively we're not allowed to do it i don't know what the well, rules don't worry are. about that we're not talking but about rules in, we're uh, doing in terms of first principles we absolutely hodl that's what we should be doing. <laughs> what does that remind me what it stands for? Hold on. No, it just no. means hold, but somebody well, typed no, no, it, it wrong. There's, no, no, there's it conflicting versions. So it it's, it's either for something. No, no, no. It's, it was, hang it, on. <laughs> hang on. It means something. It does, no, it hold doesn't. On for it means hold. Hold on for dear life. Hold on for dear life. No, but the way, the, 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 or, it was the, the origin of the thing. <laughs> it was just a time. He said, I'm, I'm, the guy, it was one of the Bitcoin bear markets, and there was a guy who was very frustrated, and he said, damn this, I'm hodling. And it was a typo. Okay. All right. And well, you'll know that. Any from. any Bitcoin um, hodlers in the audience? 
Oh, there we go. Oh, God, it's picking up. I might have to change my view on this. Real, real, you know, real, a few years ago, there was adoption. nobody. Huh? Real world adoption. Yeah, well, you were early adoption, right? We, we were, we you were, were very early yes, adoption. We, we, we were, well, not as early as... as, uh, Ruffer, as Ruffer at some point held Bitcoin in, in, in the fund, and it was yeah. much discussed in the financial it industry. We all, find, we all find it either rather exciting or rather disturbing, one and or the I, other. I think when we when we sold, um, which which was relatively well, well-timed, uh, we wrote an article, or I wrote an article called uh, "We We Waddled, Not Hoddled." <laughs> that was, that was, and, and Very good. We, we have not revisited it. That's why you need the rougher review. <laughs> Jokes like this, they just keep coming. <laughs> right, let's move on. Um, Duncan, let's have let's have your quote. Oh, right. Um, mine is slightly less high uh, There is no art which one government sooner learns of another than that of draining money from the pockets of the people, uh, and that you know that. It's pretty straightforward, uh, which, uh, which 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 drew drew me to it. Uh, it felt very sort of um, suitable for this for this moment in time. Uh, you know the 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 black hole <laughs> that Ra- that Rachel Reeve discovered that anyone with half a brain uh, already knew knew was there, um, and the it, it sort of brings brings me back to this this uh, uh, phrase that I've I've used frequently with uh, friends, family, private clients that we that we deal with. Um, if they have, if you have money, they are coming for you. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And, and uh, various different means and methods, taxes and inflation, they are coming for your wealth to fill the very large hole in uh, in government finances that has been accumulated over you know multiple decades, multiple governments. No real specific apportionment of blame here. Oh, blame someone. Come on. <laughs> The political class, but 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 the, the voters that vote for them are yeah culpable. Just just as culpable. So really, democracy is culpable, yeah. right? We endlessly yeah. vote, endlessly vote yeah. um, for more and more and more and more and more, and our politicians spend more and more and more. So who's to blame? Is it us? And we had who was it? I said, yes, it was. It was um, a guest on the podcast uh, some years ago who told me that the national debt should be blamed on women. <laughs> Controversial opinion. Okay, okay. And so then he, he showed me a chart, and it is absolutely true that uh, government spending went berserk around the same time that women got the vote. And when you start to think about it, it makes complete sense. Because until women have the vote, politicians don't have to promise, uh, you know, uh, good health care. They don't have to promise child care. They don't have to promise much in the way of education. They don't have to promise social care, because this is all ladies' work. But as soon as women get the vote, to buy those votes, you have to start promising to pay for all the things that women normally pick up. And so suddenly the role of the state massively expanded. I don't know, it was fascinating. I don't feel guilty about this, by the way. But um, but it was interesting. Sorry, diversion. I, I think that sort of comes back to this this idea of, of managed decline. Mm. You know, increasingly, we fight over the uh, the share of the pie, You know how we divide the pie rather than attempt to grow the pie. Mm. And and that's why people people vote for politicians that will tax some sort of other, you know, the rich, which all which is always defined as a someone bit, richer a bit, than a me, bit more money than I have, um, and, and and will take from the rich and, and reapportion it hopefully to me. So, which taxes do you think do this well-off audience have to worry about? Is it capital gains tax? Yeah, well, this is not financial advice, uh, but but I think the the. The obvious one that I think has a plausible sounding justification is the equalization of capital gains and income tax. But without inflation indexing, because that's where my concern is, is that if capital gains tax came with an indexing to inflation, I kind of wouldn't mind because you've been being taxed on genuine wealth. But if it's not indexed to inflation, you are being taxed on... To come back to your earlier point, that would be a, a huge win for the lawyers and accountants. Right? Yeah. Because the, the administration of constantly adjusting your book cost yeah. by inflation would be... I mean, that's a win for them. A, a, a but revenue, with, a but without list. it, there will yeah. be a genuinely a genuinely high wealth tax in the UK. I mean, there is, it already is a wealth tax in the UK, but it's not indexed at the moment. But if it suddenly was 40% or 45%, you would find your wealth would disappear extremely quickly. Then they're not going to index it. They should do. I couldn't agree more, but they're not going to. One, because of the administrative headache mm, that it will mm. create. And two, because of the tacit admission of how fiat money loses its purchasing power. <laughs> but remember, would... it was indexed until very recently. It was called rather removed index, I know, indexation. But that's 15, more than 15 years ago everyone's now. Everyone's forgotten. So everyone's forgotten. Yeah. Um, I couldn't agree more about the Adam Smith uh, 
if you look at the rise of income tax, when it was first brought in in the, in the early, I mean, it was originally tried out in the Napoleonic Wars, but it really only became a thing uh, World War One and World War Two, and co countries pretty much once it they, it was shown to work in one place, countries around the world copied it very quickly, and income tax is just now normal everywhere. Fifty percent of government revenue around the world comes from income tax. You then look at VAT. A French invention. Another thing we should blame the French for. But we'll again, run through the full list. It was, a, it was an extremely effective tax, uh, very simple to administer. And I think now um, it, they don't have it in the States, but more than 100 countries around the world now have VAT uh, for, or, or you know, forms of VAT. So when a tax is shown to work in one place, other countries will very quickly copy. And it's not so much a tax thing, but it's a regulatory thing. But we saw it like mad in the response to COVID. Um, you know, administrations around the world were floundering. They didn't know what to do. And one country did this and it brought in these regulations, masks and, and distancing and all the rest of it, which has since been proven that it wasn't really not effective. Not getting into that now. No, 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 no but it's, it's since been proven it wasn't effective. <laughs> but every country just copied everyone else. Yeah. And I think that's the, uh, it's the inherent thing of career risk. It's like, oh, well, they did it. So we can do it and it's absolutely fine. You know, we're not having to stick our necks out and make a decision. And the only country that went against the game was Sweden. So countries do copy mm. each other. But then we, have, we do now have, we're about to have, we're on the verge of having a massive global competition to get the super rich to move, right? So sure. we have, you see, everyone will have seen the charts showing that um, the UK is uh, top of the list of having the very well off leave, mm -hmm. uh, non-doms leaving, in fact, a, there is an excellent are quote we, are for we this. Are China? Are we, are we even to, no, China is a little ahead of yeah, us, actually. Yeah. China first and then us. There's then, quite a lot more of them. Yeah, I'm going to read you this, uh, one of my favourite quotes on this. It's not actually written about non-doms, but near as damn it. The proprietor of stock is necessarily a citizen of the world and is not necessarily attached to any particular country. He would be apt to abandon the country in which he was exposed to a vexatious inquisition in order to be assessed to a burdensome tax and would remove his stock to some other country where he could either carry on his business or enjoy his fortune more at ease, which is why pretty much every rich person in the UK is currently trying to buy a house in Milan, right? Yeah, but I, I do think if, if one, like wealth, the problem with wealth taxes is that there's lots of sort of slight wealth taxes, but a pure wealth tax, they're actually very difficult from a practical uh, point of view to actually impose uh, for all sorts of reasons. And, but if one country finds a way of imposing an effective wealth tax, and it might just be simply raising capital gains tax in line with income tax, um, and it works, and when I say works, I mean works from the point of view of easy to administer, easy to impose, raises a lot of money. I mean, works from the government's point of view, not from the people's point of view. But if one person can, if one country makes it work, then other countries will copy it very quickly. Yeah. Can, yeah. can I just say, um, yes, you can. Dominic has achieved the impossible by actually writing an interesting book about taxation. Yeah, <laughs> so he goes mad away today. It's called uh, Daylight Robbery, highly recommended. Thank you very, very much. Very highly recommended. Um, now, the other interesting thing, you will know about this from, from that very book, is that there is a new swell of support for a land value tax. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw um, yesterday, Dominic's staying with me at the moment, so we're reading the same newspapers. In the FT and the Times yesterday, or possibly the day before, there were articles about a land value tax and how land should be taxed. And this is something that you know we write about a lot because in a perfect world of taxation, you would have a land value tax and nothing else. But of course, in the imperfect world, the very, very imperfect we live, world we live in, it looks like that we may see some version of that on top of our current tax yeah, regime. Yeah, that's the problem. I, I'm a big fan of land value tax. If you go back to its original Georges principles, it replaces other tax. Yeah. And I actually call it, in daylight robbery, I call it location value tax rather than land value tax. Because if you, as soon as you say land value tax, farmers tear their hair out and they think okay. they're going to be killed. Whereas it's, it's based on the location and it's prime city centre real estate like Buckingham Palace that mm -hmm. would pay the most tax, uh, not you know, Johnny Farmer, where the rental value of the land is very low. So I call it location value tax. But where I see it, the problem with imposing a land value tax is that there is a long history of governments trying to impose new taxes and then losing the gig of being government as a result. People rising up and, you know, the community charge, Margaret Thatcher is, is the most recent famous example. So I, and, it's, and the other problem with locate land value tax is it's a very hard tax to explain. And uh, so people won't like it because most people's prime, most valuable thing is their home and they don't want to have to pay tax on that 
in t- on top of paying tax on everything else. Well, of course they don't, but if they had to pay no other tax at all, yeah, but that's 70 not times on where they live. That's the ideal it's never version, gonna that's not going to happen. happen. In the real world, we'll get a bastardized version of, of land value tax in addition to other taxes. It'll be more like the mansion tax. There'll be all sorts of exemptions. They'll be exempting exactly the wrong people. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it'll just end up being, you know, crony capitalist and unfair and, and the middle class will pay rather than what Henry George originally intended. Just like everything else. Now, there is, and uh, you, some of you may, may feel like this, a large group of well of people who say they would like to pay more tax, who would like to pay more tax. No? Okay. There's a, a group in the US called Patriotic million, Millionaires who say that they would love to be taxed more and they spend a lot of time lobbying the government for higher taxes on the very well off. And we have a, a similar a group here, not a very big one, mind you, but a similar yeah, one. Sort of low um, Exactly. And one of the things that we keep saying to them is if you would like to pay more tax, you can do so. There is a mechanism for that. You can call the uh, debt office in the UK and you can just hand over as much cash as you like. I've written a few columns about this and it turns out that it's happening. Right? So last year, uh, I think something like four and a half thousand pounds was given to paying off <laughs> paying off the UK national debt, which obviously is not going to make much of a dent. It's not even, it's not even one pothole. No, but <laughs> this year, this year so far, we're up to over seven hundred thousand pounds already. So there are patriotic millionaires out there who are very keen to pay more tax. And I believe they should be allowed to. A stunning lack of imagination. Stunning the, lack the of imagination. The best thing that they can think of to do with their money is to give it to the government to allocate on their behalf. Yeah. yeah. No, well, no, no, no particular charity that they would rather give it no, to. And yeah. also really, really bad in numbers if they think that's going to make a difference. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, would, this is a, I would rather play lower taxes and then I'd do more good work. Yeah. I mean, it's so. kind of it's the UK net zero of debt management, isn't it? Well, yeah. Nice joke. Right. Dominic. So my quote is this one, and it's from Wealth of Nations, book four, and it is the natural effort of every individual to better his own condition is so powerful that it is alone and without any assistance, not only capable of carrying on the society to wealth and prosperity, but of surmounting a hundred impertinent obstructions with which the folly of human laws too often encumbers its operations. And we see a marvellous example of this very dynamic at work here in Edinburgh at the Fringe. So you may not know this, but there's no other event in the world that sells more tickets than the Edinburgh Festival. There's only one event in the world that does, the Olympic Games. And apart from that, the Edinburgh Fringe sells more tickets than any other event. It is an incredible economic success story. And yet, outside of the bubble of Edinburgh, hardly anyone knows about it. And you ask yourself, why do people, why do performers come to the Edinburgh Fringe? And they don't come here out of charity. Performers don't come here to fix climate change or house the homeless or sort out famine in Africa. Every single performer comes here out of self-interest. There are four reasons why a performer comes here. Either he comes here to get noticed, he wants to be the next flea bag or the next flight of the Concords or the next Tom Stoppard, Stoppard. Or he comes here to get better, to practice and hone his act. Or he comes here to make money. Or, and I'm saying he, they, he or she. Or they come here to um, have fun. And normally it's all four of those reasons put together. But they all boil down to self-interest. And as a result of that self-interest, we have this incredible uh, fringe. There are something like 195 countries in the world. There are visitors to Edinburgh from 170 of them over the course of the festival. And way more than the population of Edinburgh passes through Edinburgh during uh, the festival itself. Loads of opportunities uh, for people to make money. And then you look at all the Um, impertinent obstructions that get thrown in the way of this festival, mostly by the Scottish Government, doing stupid things like, um, you know, their accommodation legislation, meaning it just costs a fortune to get accommodation up here, or, you know, hate speech laws just get in the ways of, of, uh, of, you know, what artists can and can't say, and, you know, a million other things over the years that we all know about. And yet performers acting in their own self-interest find a way around all of them. They just find a way. The, the perennial problem at the Fringe is not just accommodation to live in, it's finding somewhere to perform. And yet, you know, all sorts of invention and imagination takes place. So you have people acting to better their own condition and the result 
is this incredible event that is the Edinburgh Fringe. I think that's a, that, was, uh, that was very uplifting. Oh, okay. Thank you, Dominic. 170 <laughs> nations represented, and yet my hometown of uh, Glasgow seems to pretend it doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up there my whole life and never came until I moved here. Well, <laughs> Dominic, do you think the number of acts is falling, given the, the accommodation difficulties and all that kind of thing? You've, yes. You've told a great story, but I keep hearing about acts that don't come, can't come, because they can't, they can't find anywhere to sleep, let yeah. alone a venue. So... Um, it's just extraordinarily expensive now to come. Like uh, a very good friend of mine is, is a comedian and she's just renting a room in somebody's house way out of town. And just one room in one house is two grand uh, for the three and a half weeks of the festival. And she, she just won't make any money th this year. And so that's a deterrent. And I'm afraid um, the Scottish government have taken the Edinburgh Fringe for granted. You know, it needs nurturing, it needs protecting. And they just thought, sort of thought it's there, you know. And, and so numbers have, you know, the big hit was obviously COVID and it's never yet regained the numbers that were there prior to COVID. But until COVID, the fringe had grown. It, was, it first happened in 1947, I want to say. And in every year but three, the fringe grew until 2020 but I'm afraid it's fallen every year since then. So I just wanted to kind of contrast what Dominic said about the Fringe being this amazing arts festival with what Duncan said about we're in a situation of managed decline. And I keep hearing this managed decline thing, not simply here in Britain, but across Europe, and even to a certain extent, well, less so in, in North America. And I actually think we need to change that narrative because what Dominic says is that we still have something here in Scotland, in Britain, in Europe, that says to me, we are not in decline. We might have kind of regulations that make things more difficult to do, but if you think about the capacity we have here in the West to be innovative, to drive forward, whether it's the arts or innovation, we should embrace that. It's kind of hard to think that when you've got rent controls and price yeah. controls yeah. and this control and that control. And, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could squeeze an extra 30 people in here? But we can't because we've got a massive overlay of regulation even in this room, right? I, I think the difference is that the, the, fr the Fringe is an organic sort of event where everyone is pursuing their own individual objectives. And the cumulative result is this phenomenal explosion of creativity and fun. And it's amazing. Uh, the managed decline that I sort of referred to, I think, is more to do with the lack of ambition of our leaders. Yeah. It's more to do with ma ma managing the economy to, you know, the 24-hour news cycle or, if you're lucky, a five-year election cycle uh, and not looking beyond that. But I think we need to just stop saying manage decline yeah, and say something different yeah. I mean, and, and put it to, to, to our political leaders to do better. To either whether that's that's you know that getting out of the way. language doesn't change reality, right? Yeah, but I, I still think there's a mentality... Uh, I mean, someone told me yesterday, oh, but you're American, so of course you're like, you know, <laughs> everything's possible. But I think, you know, there's no reason, if you think about what happened here in the 18th century, in this very home, with Adam Smith and other luminaries of the Scottish Enlightenment, and we think about what happened to Edinburgh and how it changed the world. The, the I problem. say this because I have a future. Okay, here. I'm going to move on this, from this from this um, extreme optimism, which makes me really uncomfortable. To um... that's not what I'm saying. It's not about extreme optimism. It's the sense of of it's yeah no. It, there's many reasons well, to be pessimistic. We're, we're, but we're, all, we're all great believers in human yeah. ingenuity. Yeah. But there does come a point when it can it can be squashed, doesn't it? Yeah. Anyway, we're going to move and, on to questions because I want to have questions. Otherwise, no one will win the book. Okay, that's great. <laughs> right, right. Questions. We have ten minutes. And we have a prize and we have a microphone. And if you don't ask questions, I will have to let these guys talk more and you won't like that. And the book is still up for grabs, got to say. Uh, well, microphone, I... microphone coming. You need the microphone. And by the way, you know, if you say anything awful, hate speech, etc., we will take it out. We don't want anyone in the audience. <laughs> You've just got that. Look at myself. <laughs> <laughs> no one will be arrested <laughs> after this event. Okay, I, I live in Hong Kong where I've lived for 40 years. It has a very simple tax system. In my retirement, I'm paying no tax. Would I be mad to come back to the UK? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I mean, you've seen the shift, haven't you, already uh, against... Uh, it, it's, 
where is the money? The money rests with pensioners. It rests in your pensions. It rests in your income. It rests in your houses. Not yours, obviously, you're in Hong Kong, but in most pensioners. That's where the money is. And if you, if you want to get people's wealth, you're going to go after older people. And we see it already inside, inside the pension system. We know there's going to be all kinds of shifts in there. So. But at least you know, would you want to bring a pension back on shore? They're coming after well, our SIPs, are they? Oh, yeah, definitely coming after your SIP. But the value of Britain that. is that we can cr criticize the government and we can question what they do, whereas you're not allowed to do that in Hong Kong. Not now. Not now. You were until 2020. Right, so... Yeah, and who knows where we're going in the UK, yeah. right? Well, spend some time, spend some time with Twitter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, think, I think the last couple of weeks shows that the level of criticism that you're allowed to aim in certain directions is less than we maybe thought. Yeah, there's a there's growing illiberalism. I think that that is is troubling across um, the so-called liberal democracies. Well, how do you feel about the effectiveness of uh, inheritance tax? And um, the other question is, no, 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 that, we're, 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 we're each. you don't you don't win the book by asking lots. That's not what works. Who's the um, Inheritance tax. Um, I will answer very quickly, and then Dominic may have a view. Inheritance tax, I think, is an appalling tax, and it should be shifted to a gift tax. Uh, which would be much, much fairer. Uh, so, you know, you had a gift allowance throughout a lifetime. Now, ideally, none of it, but if you must have one, a gift tax is fairer. My objection to inheritance tax, I, ha I have all the normal in objections to inheritance tax. It doesn't fall on the super rich. It falls on the middle class. Um, uh, you know, you've paid taxes all your life. Why should you pay them in death? All, all of those arguments that you hear. But my biggest objection to inheritance tax is, in, is a, an argument that you don't hear very often. And it is this. When it is an attack on the institution that is the family, and the family is the most institu important institution there is, and the family home is in many cases what keeps a family together. And when a family is going through a period of mourning, when they have to then go through, do all this admin that you have to do, and then they're forced to sell the family home, and it it erodes, the, I won't say it destroys the family, even although in many cases it does, it just erodes it away. And the family home should be the core of that family and it keeps families together. And, and that's why I don't like inheritance. Yeah, I'm never sure about that. They always flog the home anyway. Mm. Sorry? They always flog the home anyway. I Not mean, always. Never convinced. Not always. That Many one. would keep it if they could. Yeah, maybe. Uh, last question here in the front. Thank you. So the average person is encouraged to invest in stock markets in order to get real returns and to share in growth in the economy. If there's no link between stock markets and GDP growth, what should the average person do? Buy the S&P. Buy the S&P. Yeah, well, so, so the average person invests in the stock market so that they can get a claim on the earnings of the companies in the stock market. So um, yeah, Warren Buffett says you should invest in the S&P. Dominic says you should invest in the S&P. I might suggest a wealth preservation fund that's relatively well known in the UK. Um, but it does begin with R. Um, but yeah, I, I think that that's the distinction. You, you invest in the stock market to get your proportionate claim of the earnings of that company and the growth and the creativity of that company that hopefully happens in the in future years. Ultimately, that does add up to the whole economy, but there is there is that sort of the severing of that link. We we have a thing in my newsletter, the, the Flying Frisbee, we have, I've created a thing called the Dolce Far Niente portfolio, which is a, a portfolio designed around doing nothing. You don't have to keep worrying about your investments. We have a little bit of gold, a little bit of oil and gas, a little bit of the S&P, which is the American stock market, and, and a tiny amount of Bitcoin. And we just have those four assets, and we might roll out of oil and gas at, a, at another time, but we, we think, you know, whatever's going on in the market, they all point to ownership of those assets for the time being. And we have to stop. But I will just say one last thing based on what Dominic says about being, it being a very good idea to do nothing. There was a study from Fidelity four or five years ago that looked into the accounts that uh, people held with them and the ones that were the best performing. And the best performing accounts across the board were held by guess who? The dead. Dead people. <laughs> <laughs> A glowing endorsement of my industry. <laughs> because they never fiddle. They never fiddle. Right, so another argument time. for inheritance tax. So yeah. I, can't, I can't do the bit where I ask them each to give us their favourite investment because we've run out of time unless they want to do it in one word. At the moment. Yep, just one. Go. Oil and gas. Just one. UK equities. Uh, the United States of America stock market. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And that is it. And thank you so much to my wonderful guests and to you for being such a marvellous audience.
Thanks for listening to this week's Marin Talks Money. If you like our show, rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And keep sending your questions or comments to marinmoney at bloomberg.net. This episode was produced by me, Marin Somerset Webb. It was produced by Summer Saadi. Production support and sound by Moses Andam. And special thanks, of course, to Dominic Frisby, to Adam Dixon, Duncan McGuinness, and to Blair Barrows at Pamia House for all his help. And be sure to follow me and John on Twitter or X at MarinSW and at John underscore Stefik. Thanks for listening. <laughs>